I think there is this lingering concern about demand because of the trade war fears. But certainly the big story was that Saudi Arabia and Russia put a lot of barrels on the market in advance of Iran sanctions. And now the question is, did they really oversupply the market with U.S. production, you know, seemingly unstoppable right now? So you used to actually write CIA intelligence assessments. I did, yes. So you know the nuances around all these documents. What, where, where are we and where will we finally end up with the Khashoggi killing, in your view, and with our approach to the Middle East? I mean, the CIA, what we know about what the CIA reportedly had in those documents was that it was a high degree of confidence that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia ordered the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The question is now, what does the White House do about it? Now, people have pointed out that the CIA assessment is not bulletproof. There is a degree of analytic judgment that is in any intelligence assessment. But the fact is, if they believe they have a high degree of confidence, that is based on multiple sourcing, not single line sourcing. And so it's pretty extraordinary to have, you know, the leading U.S. intelligence agency, you know, reportedly coming out with such a strong finding on such a sensitive issue. But don't you think, Alima, that they're coming out with a strong finding and it's been leaked in part to put pressure and put the president in a corner uh, on this very issue? I mean, clearly somebody with access to that report, a highly sensitive report, believes that, you know, this, this information needs to see the light of day. It'd be interesting to find out, you know, eventually who did leak this information, because that's a, a pretty serious offense to leak classified information. But it certainly does put the CIA and White House, you know, in a difficult position right now, because President Trump, you know, continues to stand by, you know, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. You know, we've sanctioned 17 individuals, the Treasury did last week, but the Saudi Crown Prince is not on on that list. And so we're going to have to look at really what Congress does with this information. There are a lot of prominent Republican senators right, right now, Lindsey Graham at the top of the list, that are really trying to put tougher sanctions on Saudi Arabia and continue to say that the Saudi crown prince was behind the Khashoggi killing. What would, be, so, what, would be the, what would be the result of putting sanctions on MBS himself? I mean, the question is, would it potentially then, you know, block his ability to travel to the United States? Would it potentially freeze his assets? You know, I do think what Congress is trying to do right now is they're trying to basically look at the war in Yemen and say, should the U.S. use this, you know, incident to potentially put more pressure on Saudi Arabia to wind down the war in Yemen? So what Lindsey Graham is talking about doing is blocking the sale of offensive weaponry to Saudi Arabia. They're basically using the Yemen war is the path to sort of have leverage over the crown prince. Right. No, what I'm asking is what are the implications, economic implications, market implications, if they were to do that on the United States? I mean, in terms of what the, if, if the crown prince was added to that list, I mean, it certainly would be, you know, complicated in terms of investing in anything that he had a stake in, for example. I think putting him on the sanctions list would certainly more broadly make it more difficult for U.S. investors to get behind a number of the Vision 2030 initiatives that are going to be required if this program is going to be successful. So I think it would be more damaging to Saudi's overall economic program if you had the de facto head of state put on a sanctions list. What happens if you were put on for six months as a, um, almost just a, a symbolic sanction? I mean, it's an interesting question. If you put him on for six months, you know, then it becomes up to each individual corporate how they feel about investing in Saudi Arabia. Now, there will be companies that will continue to have to invest in Saudi Arabia. Like, energy companies are going to continue to invest in Saudi Arabia because they have a longstanding relationship with Saudi Aramco. And Saudi Aramco in no way has been implicated in this. But, again, for any of the sort of tech investments going forward, those type of sectors, I think, are going to find it hard to do business with Saudi Arabia. So they're mad. Uh, that we allowed Iran to get around some of these uh, sanctions, and they want it back at 80. Uh, is it, this is not a great time for them to <laughs> decide to send it back up to 80. Do you think that's what's going to happen, Helena, with the Saudis? Well, I think this is a really interesting question about why statements coming out of OPEC didn't gain more traction last week, because they were very forceful saying, we're going to do whatever it takes. But I think there's a corner of the market that says, well, wait a second, is Saudi Arabia really going to go forward with removing so many barrels 
in, or in a situation where President Trump remains a stalwart ally of the Saudi government? Would they want to offend President Trump, given the fact that he continues to stand by the Saudi leadership? That said, there's also a view that I heard last week in Abu Dhabi that, look, the Saudis were led to believe that there would be no exemptions or no waivers granted to Iran, and were not happy at all that eight countries received waivers. And some believe that they were sort of tricked into putting so many barrels on the market in advance of those sanctions. It's going to be very interesting to see where Saudi Arabia comes down on this issue. I believe ultimately they're going to side with their own economic welfare and remove those barrels, but this is a very tricky relationship they have to navigate with the White House.